Thanks, guys. Uh, I am going to do Common Core for, for a bit, and to do this, I, I hope possibly to save time. I'm going to. I've done several programs with Glenn Beck on Common Core, and this has been a national issue for us. A lot of research we've done, a lot of things we can point wrong to it. It's like it's a target-rich environment. I mean, it's not hard to find things that are a real problem with Common Core. The longer it goes, the more problems come out with it. So what I want to do is I want to take a portion of a program that we did that presents five of the problems with Common Core. It's going to take nine or ten minutes. I'm going to show that video, uh, and then after that I can jump into some other stuff and hopefully give you a 30,000 foot view of, of what it looks like. You see, this old stuff represents true academic rigor. Education Day is moving further and further away from it, and Common Core certainly seems to be contributing. And maybe part of the problem is the new teaching methods that are associated with teaching Common Core. Look at this clip from M.J. McDermott, a local television personality in Washington State. She's going to explain one of the crazy new ways that math is being taught there. Watch this. Another popular algorithm taught in everyday math is the lattice method. Same problem, 26 times 31. This time we have to set up a lattice. Works like this. We put the 26 on top and the 31 along the side like that. And then we draw these diagonals. And then we do 1 times 6 and fill it in like that, 0, 6. 3 times 6, 18. 1 times 2, no effort to say 1 times 20, by the way, 0, 2. And 3 times 2, 0, 6. Now we add it up along the diagonal. 6, 8, 0 plus 2 is 10, carry the 1. 6, 7, 8, time, and 0 is 8 and a zero there. And the answer is read this way. There's your answer, 806. Oh, it's kind of fun. It works every time. But even the authors of Everyday Math admit in their teacher's manual why the lattice method works is not immediately obvious, but it is very efficient and powerful. The principal disadvantages of the algorithm are that it is unfamiliar to many adults, i.e. parents, and making the lattice takes time. Okay, so teaching this new lattice method of working problems is going to help student knowledge? I don't think so. But you see, this is one of the fundamental problems with progressives. It doesn't matter how well something is already working or how long it's been working well. They're always wanting change. They're always wanting to move forward or lean forward. And they want to leave the old things behind. You see, progressives are all about progress after all. They want to implement the new, even if the old works well and the new doesn't. And did you notice that MJ pointed out that parents will not know the lattice method? So parents won't even be able to help their own kids with math. And this is also part of what progressives do. They want everyone dependent on them. They, they want the kids to rely on government officials for their knowledge and help, not on their parents. But let's not stop with just using new and and impossible teaching methods. Let's look at this clip from a recent educational conference and notice a statement that kids getting the right answer is not necessarily the overall objective of progressive math education. Watch this. Even under the new Common Core, if, even if they said 3 times 4 was 11, if they were able to explain their reasoning and explain how they came up with their answer really in um, words and oral explanations, and they showed it in the picture, but they just got the final number wrong. We're really more focusing on the how. The right answer doesn't really matter, just how you got it. Okay, now I understand. Uh, maybe she was trying to say that it was important for kids to know why things work. That is to know the process behind getting the right answer. Uh, that's fine. All right, I'll buy that. But to say that in education under Common Core, we're not going to focus on getting right answers? How about getting right answers and getting the process? You see, maybe this is why test scores dropped in Kentucky. Who knows? But in addition to all of these immediate problems, Common Core also presents serious problems for the future of the republic. Common Core. It's the new national educational initiative that not only weakens local and state controls of education, but also fundamentally changes what students will learn. For example, 
standards teach that the future of the planet is threatened by man-made global warming. But there has been no global warming for almost two decades, and this despite the steadily rising atmospheric carbon dioxide that supposedly drives global warming. And we're also told that global warming's melting of the polar ice caps would cause sea rise and massive coastal flooding. Yet ice is actually expanding in Antarctica, which has 90% of the Earth's ice. And it even turns out that data was misrepresented by global warming alarmists to make recent temperatures look warmer than they've actually been and past temperatures look cooler. Yet none of these facts prevent Common Core from making man-made global warming a fundamental part of its education standards. This is not education. It's political indoctrination. Just one more of the many reasons why Common Core is bad for students bad for states and bad for America. And here's another one on a different issue. Common Core. Maybe you've heard of it. It's the new national educational initiative that not only weakens local and state controls of education, but also fundamentally changes what students will learn. For example, under Common Core, cursive handwriting will no longer be taught. But that sounds reasonable. After all, kids send text, Facebook, and email messages to each other, so who needs cursive writing? But this means that students will no longer be able to read the journals of George Washington, or the letters of John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, or James Madison, or for that matter, even the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, which are written in cursive. In fact, students won't even be able to read the letters that their own grandparents or great-grandparents may have written and saved for their family's heritage. Under Common Core, cursive writing will become a language as foreign to students as ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Removing a student's ability to directly study American historical documents is just one of the many reasons why Common Core is bad for students, bad for states, and bad for America. Contact your legislators and let them know that you oppose Common Core. I tell you, it's not a good thing not to be able to read early American documents for yourself. In fact, let me tell you how I first got involved in history some years ago. I was a school principal, and I read some really old documents that I'd been taught about in school. But when I read those actual documents for myself, I found that those documents were dramatically different from what my teachers and textbooks had taught me about those documents. That's when we started collecting documents. And now we have more than 100,000 originals or copies of originals from before 1812. Every student should be able to read America's founding documents for themselves, but that becomes much harder with Common Core. And in addition to the lack of academic rigor in Common Core, the dumb teaching methods used, and severing us from the ability to check our own history, there's also the data mining part of Common Core. Remember this article from The Blaze? Indoctrination, data mining, and common core. Here's why America's schools may be in more trouble than you think. And remember this article? American Thinker. There seems to be little recognition yet that the common core gives schools and third parties unprecedented access to students' personal information. The federal government is acquiring a massive amount of data that can be sold to the highest bidders. So, they'll take our private data? Well, that really shouldn't worry anyone. I mean, we trust the government to do the right thing with all that data they're going to collect from our kids about us. And, and if you want proof, you want proof they'll do the right thing? That's easy. Just think of how well the NSA and the IRS have protected and respected our personal data. I mean, so what's to worry? Okay, so maybe there is some history of the government agencies abusing our personal data. But remember, this data collected about us from our kids can be sold to private groups. And what's so bad about that? All you have to do is listen to what David Coleman has to say, and you can immediately see the problems and the dangers. David Coleman is the president of the College Board, and they're the ones who produce the SAT test for college-bound students. Time Magazine calls him, quote, the architect in education because, as they explain, his quiet work behind the scenes on the proposed Common Core Standards makes him among the most influential figures in American education today. So David Coleman, who definitely strongly supports Common Core, is going to give us an example of how private information can be used in sophisticated ways to advance progressive causes. 
Listen to this clip of him at a New York educational conference. Let's remember who really won the election. Shall we call it Nate Silver? Against all the blowhards of political commentary, the predictions of the nerds were decisive. But perhaps more exciting than the person who stood to the side and handicapped the election is the person who led the Obama campaign's use of data to galvanize a generation of low-income people to vote like they had never had before. Whether you are Republican or Democrat, the simple precision and excellence of the use of information to achieve a result is something in my mind that deserves astonishment. It means, again, that there is no force greater. Think about it. Think about it. Hundreds of millions of dollars spent on this campaign. And what made the difference, right? A lot of things. But this incredible precision and insight gained from data, not only knowing where people are, but testing various interventions, seeing what works, keeping focused on delivering them. Um, that's not how I want my private information used. And I don't care whether it's for the Obama campaign or anybody else's campaign. I don't. Okay, that's 10 minutes. That's five issues. I can give you another 30 issues on Common Core. Um, there's no shortage of issues. Having said that, there's something that I want to do with, with the other time that I have left here, and that is to try to take this thing to a 30,000-foot view if I can. Um, let me go back to this slide. Talking about Common Core, the problem we've got with Common Core is, in a lot of ways, um, we're literally trying to put lipstick on a pig. Uh, we've got bigger problems of what Common Core represents, and there's some fundamental problems with education, and we're just playing around the edges. I mean, we literally are a dog chasing our tail when it comes to education. We've forgotten what education is for. We've forgotten how bad we are with it. Uh, if you, if you want to know even how bad it is now, you look at ISI, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. These are the folks that every year they test Americans to see if they know enough to be citizens. They, they start with the assumption that, you know, if you live in the South Pole, you've never heard of America in your life and you move here, you have to pass an immigrant's entry test to get here. There's a minimum amount of knowledge you have to know to be an American citizen. So they took 13 questions off the test and gave those 13 easiest questions to citizens who have lived here their whole life. Giving them to citizens who have lived here their whole life, 71% of them citizens didn't know enough to be a citizen, and they've lived here their whole life. That's after 13 years of school at $12,000 a year that we're spending. We're looking at $120,000, and we don't, matter of fact, it's really bad. For the first time, they gave that, that test to elected officials. 13 easy questions on them. 78% of elected officials didn't know enough to be citizens. 62% could not name the three branches of government. Now, how, how do you go through 13 years of school and you can't name the three branches of government? See, that's why Common Core, with, with all the problems Common Core's got, we're, we're looking at, at, you know, literally trying to polish the, the rails of the Titanic as it goes down. So what I want to do is, in this time, I want to take you back and give you something bigger, and then we'll come back and look at Common Core. George Mason, founding father, he was part of the 55 who wrote the Constitution, the Constitutional Convention. Uh, he literally is called the father of the Bill of Rights. He's the guy responsible for the Bill of Rights. He made a statement so profound that it was written in the Virginia Constitution in 1776. It is still there to this day. It's a great statement. He says this. He said, no free government nor the blessings of liberty can be, be preserved to any people but by a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. This frequent recurrence to fundamental principles, I want to go back to why we even did education in the first place. Because if you don't get that right, the rest of it doesn't make sense. What we have been blessed with in this country under the form of education we used was when you look at us with other, and this year there's 195 nations of the UN, you compare us to any other nation, the same period of time we've had one form of government, you take any other nation and it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, imagine living in other nations that have had this many revolutions, this many turnovers, just in the 20th century. I mean, uh, imagine being Poland. I mean, seven revolutions since 1919, seven constitutions. What we have is unprecedented, but we're so used to it, we don't think of how unusual it is. Nobody else enjoys the stability we have. In the same way, if you look at the prosperity that we have in America, we are only 4% of the world's population, and yet we produce 24% of the world's gross domestic product. Nobody has productivity like that. Everybody else is, you know, even if they're 4% producing 4%, that's pretty good for the rest of the world. We're way ahead. 
Now, this is called American Exceptionalism. That title was given us in 1831 by Alexis de Tocqueville, who traveled to America, surveyed what we had, and said, this is exceptional. I don't think any nation will ever attain what America has. Here's the cool part about it. This is what Abraham Lincoln said a century later. Abraham Lincoln, in looking at our philosophy of government, said this. He said, the philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation be the philosophy of government in the next. If we had a successful philosophy of government for two, two centuries, it's because of what we were teaching in the classroom. Now, you look where we are now, tell me what the prospect is for government in 20, 30 years from now when we're turning out kids that can't even name three branches of government, actually turning out public officials that can't name the three branches of government. So, we're, we're, you know, again, I can point out the common core, the data mining is really bad, and what they're doing with the teaching methods is really bad. If we don't get back to bigger stuff than that, we're, we're, again, just playing around the edges. So let me take you some bigger stuff. When you look at the philosophy of early American education, it did two things. Number one, the philosophy of early American education was to teach religion, morality, and knowledge in that order. That is in the federal statutes. And by the way, that's a statute under which uh, Iowa became a state. You had to agree to that order in teaching in your schools. The second thing we did was we insisted on teaching thinking skills. Now, I'm going to show you why this is different from what we do today. But you take these two things, take teaching religion, morality, knowledge. In 1789, after we had the first federal congress under the Constitution, they passed a law because they said, we've got these 13 states here, but what do we do with all the Northwest Territory and the Ohio Territory? What do we do with the, the Southern Territory? And that's where they said, well, if you want to become a state, if you live out there and want to become a state, you need to go through what was called the Northwest Ordinance. The Northwest Ordinance was passed through the House and Senate. George Washington signed it into law August 7, 1789. It's significant because all these 13 states, these, these other states came in under the Northwest Ordinance and it was extended to other states, the Southern Ordinance, the Missouri Territory, et cetera. So if you look at Ohio and Indiana and Illinois and Iowa and Missouri and Kansas and Nebraska, Arkansas, they all came in under it, which is significant because Article 3 of the Northwest Ordinance said this, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. Because we want good government and the happiness of mankind, what we're going to do in schools is teach religion, morality, and knowledge. You could not be a state in the United States if that was not your philosophy of education. That's what we had for two centuries. It's still in a number of constitutions, state constitutions of the day, North Carolina and Nebraska and Ohio and so many have, it says forever in the public schools of the state, religion, morality, and knowledge will be taught as well as, will be taught. Religion, morality will be taught as well as knowledge. So this is the philosophy. That's the first point. That's, that's what we did in education. That's what we taught. That's where we were until 1963. The second thing that I want to point to is teaching these thinking skills. You look at the thinking skills, there was a textbook that was famous in America for over 200 years, and that textbook was The Improvement of the Mind by Isaac Watts. That was reprinted across the generations and across the centuries. It was all about teaching you how to think, and one of the ways they did that was through the use of what was called forensics. Now, I have to admit, I didn't know much about forensics in this context. This is a founding father textbook. This is from Harvard back in the early 1800s, and these forensics I didn't know anything about, but look it up, and forensics and that's a Latin term from 1650 that means to learn the art of public argumentation. If you can't publicly argue something, you haven't thought through it. So if you can learn to publicly argue, be a good spokesman, be an articulate speaker, it's because you've arranged your thoughts. They helped you do this. I'm going to show you what they... Now, this, is, this was for 13-year-olds. What I'm going to show you here is what we did for 13... At Harvard, by the way, 13-year-olds were very common at Harvard. So 13-year-olds at Harvard. Here, here's a forensic... The conduct of the Patriots who destroyed the Tea Harbor and Boston Harbor in 1773. Is that to be condemned? In other words, it was a debate. The prof would walk in the class and he'd say, all right, you two guys right there, you're going to say that, it, that, that we should condemn what happened in 1773, and you're going to say that we should praise what happened in 1773. All right, you two go at it right now. No preparation. No, you have to, it doesn't matter what side you take. You've got to listen to what the other person says and find the weaknesses in what they're saying, find out how to re-argue. And so the thing was, 13-year-olds are going at it just like this in class. Just, just at, Now, is there a right or wrong answer to that question? I don't think so. You can take both sides. And that's why they always chose things that made you have to think and have to recognize weaknesses in someone else's argument. Look at this one. I associate with no one. I employ no one who's not of my party in religion and politics. You can have a good fight over that one. That's what you did in class. Look at this. Is there less danger in believing too much or too little? Which is more dangerous, to believe too much or believe too little? And this one, is there more to be gained or lost by translation of the scriptures for common use? 
there's no right and wrong to any of this. That's exactly the point. They were making you think. You had to go through and get systematic in your thinking. You had to make your points. You had to make your public arguments. And then they'd reverse you. said, all right, now you're on the other side. Go after it from the other direction. See, this was all about thinking. Now, this, this thing about thinking, we got away from all of this. We said religion, morality, knowledge, no, we can't do that anymore. That, that's unconstitutional. And, and so the Supreme Court, June the 25th of 62, said, no more school prayer, no more Bible reading. It all goes out. We're not doing religion, morality, and knowledge anymore. So that went away. In the same way, thinking, we said, we're not doing that. What happened was we changed the way that we taught. You see, the Progressive Education Association, they came in and said, and by the way, if you don't know progressive educators, they're famous in the education community, Robert Ingersoll, uh, Parker, uh, Lester Ward, you have Kirkpatrick, and of course you've got Dewey. These are all famous progressive educators that taught the teaching methods that we still use in schools today. These are the guys who changed the way we were at, and their philosophy was real simple. They said, you know, we've, got to, we, we've been doing teaching kids how to think. What we need to do is we need to teach them how to learn. And so we went from teaching kids how to think to teaching them how to learn. Now, the problem with that is it changes the focus from the student down to the teacher. No longer is the student the focus. We want to teach you how to think. In other words, we're not going to give you a fish. We're going to teach you how to fish, that, that axiom, that proverb. We're now saying it all comes through the teacher. You, you've got to learn it through the teacher. And, and so the problem is we are taught to learn now. Whatever the teacher puts out, that's what we just take and ingest and put it in, and we have to spit it back out. That's the period of time in which we changed the way that we did testing. You see, we suddenly went to things like fill in the blank, and we went to true-false, and we went to multiple choice because we're just spitting back out whatever the teacher taught us. We're not thinking on our own. We're not going and finding information for our own. We're just repeating what we've been taught. And so that whole team, you try to find these kind of tests in the founding era, you try to find those in the 1800s, early 1900s, you won't do it. It was when we got into that change of mentality that the teacher is the most important thing in the classroom that everything changed, including the way we teach. So what we have, we, we changed from thinking to learning. We got rid of the thinking, we go to learning. And the problem is, if you're a learning-centered generation, that makes you extremely gullible. See, whatever somebody teaches, I heard it on the news. Remember that, that, uh, that commercial? Uh, if it's on the internet, it's gotta be true. You know, they wouldn't lie on the internet. That makes you really gullible, which is why indoctrination is so significant now. And that's what so much of Common Core is, is indoctrination. Matter of fact, one of the things I didn't get into, you ought to see the recommended reading list they have on the literature side. Some of the books we focused on in Beck's program, one of them was really amazing. 11th grade, juniors in high school, recommended reading was this, this book where that in the book, very graphic sexual relations including rape and incest in the book, very graphic. And we looked for at least some condemnation of rape or incest, it wasn't there asked the author, how come you didn't say anything was wrong with rape or incest? And the answer was, well, if one of the students engaged in that, I don't want them to feel bad about what they're doing. Really? Real? See, and the literature list is, is abominable. To look at what the literature list is compared to the things we used to have in literature class. So it's indoctrination. Indoctrination only works if you don't think. If you don't know how to think, then you're really open to indoctrination. And that's the problem with education, and that's why Common Core is now doing so well in so many areas, plus it has the economic incentive that so many people want the money. So when you look at the results of the change, there's some things we can point to fairly easily. Dr. Benjamin Rush, who is called the father of public schools under the Constitution, founding father, signer of the Declaration Frame, he's a ratifier of the Constitution. John Adams said he's one of the three most notable founding fathers. As an educator, he started five universities, three still go today. He's the first professor of chemistry in the United States, first chemistry textbook, first psychiatry textbook. Uh, again, he's the father of public schools. This is what he said. He said, without religion, I believe learning does real mischief to the morals and principles of mankind. If you don't have rights and wrongs, like rape and incest, we can't say that something like that's wrong. If you don't have standards, then learning is real dangerous for the community. And that's where we've gotten to. We don't have rights and wrongs anymore, and that's what we see in the literature courses. He also did a piece in 1791. He gave a dozen reasons would never take the Bible out of public schools in America. Now, in that piece, and this was done March the 10th, 1791, in that piece, he said, you know, if we ever get to the point where we take the Bible out of schools, we'll spend all of our time and money fighting crime when we could prevent crime in the classroom by teaching the principles out of the scriptures. So that was his position. Now, I was in the Justice Department for a number of years as a consultant. This is violent crime. This is one that we took the Bible out of school, 62, 63, 694% increase. They say, this is why we're playing around the fringes out here. That The problem is back here. 
It's that fundamental change of philosophy that we had. We stopped teaching kids how to think. We stopped the religion morality that led to knowledge. We have the same thing. He says here, I believe there's the most knowledge in those countries, there's the most Christianity. There's six nationally normed standardized tests we use in education today. California Achievement Test, Stanford Achievement Test, the Iowa Test of Basic Skills. Kids from Christian schools and from public schools use them. We have 12% of the nation that attends either homeschooling or Christian schooling. And it's amazing that on those tests, what you find is, see, this is the SAT test, which goes to 1926. Again, take God out. But in the 12% of private education, their scores are still back up here where it had been prior to 62-63. The 88% public schools, that number has continued to drop. It is bellied out here in the middle because you have that 12% that's this much higher. For the 12% that still teaches religion, morality, knowledge, they're back there prior to 62-63 like nothing's happened. Interesting stat. Same thing when you look at those achievement tests. You find that uh, by the time you get to ninth grade, Christian schools have pegged out the achievement test. Public schools haven't. At 12th grade, public schools still haven't. We don't know how much higher Christian schools go, but it averages two to four grade levels higher. This would make sense if the questions asked on that achievement test were things like, how many books are there in the Bible? What is John 3.16? That wouldn't be fair for public school kids. It's not what it says. It says, solve the following algebraic equations. It says things like, what year did the Civil War take place? And the best of my knowledge, Civil War takes place the same year in a Christian school does in a public school. But for some reason, the knowledge is much higher because, again, you're doing the thinking process. You have a different philosophy, different approach. This is what's happened since that point in time. 62, 63, we were number one in the world in literacy. We have now dropped to number 65 in the world in literacy. America gets its socks beat off by, by all sorts of other nations, international testing. Matter of fact, we now average about 700,000 students a year who graduate from high school who cannot read their own diploma. So the functional literates in America, meaning they read at third grade or less, we're looking at 700,000 a year. That's not good stuff for the workforce. And so much of the business community is behind Common Core because they've been taught this will give you a much more rigorous workforce. No, not when you're losing 700,000 a year that don't even read at third grade level after, thir after 13 years of school. You also have the international testing. Now, we have, it seems that we're starting to make a little bit of turnaround in international testing. 17 and 19 years, we had been coming in dead last international testing. We, in elementary school and recent one, our kids finally finished above average with the world's kids. Uh, at junior high, they finished at average, and at high school, they finished below average. Now, please notice the trend here. If you've had a few years in American education, you're above average. If you had a few more years, you're at average, and a few more years, you're below average. The longer you spend, that's not good. That's why the, the American School Board Journal, this 16,000 school boards in America, the School Board Journal goes to those, and this is what they said. The longer U.S. students stay in school, the less they seem to know. Yeah, exactly. That's a fundamental problem we have with the way we do the whole philosophy of education right now. <coughs> Excuse me. This University of Connecticut, they spent a lot of money recently to come out with what they called the coming crisis in leadership because what they did was they took kids going in as freshmen to what we would call the elite colleges and universities, Ivy League schools, et cetera, where you're going to spend $200,000 for your diploma. They checked those kids going in as a freshman. They checked them going out as a senior and found that when you went out as a senior four years later, you knew less than when you came in as a freshman. This is what they said. At many of the most prestigious colleges in the United States, seniors seem to know less than freshmen about America's history, government, foreign affairs, and economy, a phenomenon known as negative learning. You're spending $200,000 to get less knowledge than you had when you got there. That's not the right direction. Now, what I want to do is take you back and kind of close out this section by showing you the way it used to be. We used to teach religion, morality, knowledge. We trained students to think what was the result of that. Let me take you to founding fathers like Fisher Ames. Fisher Ames is a framer of the Bill of Rights. He's the guy who actually gave us the house language for the First Amendment. That's what everybody says to me, separation, church and state. Done. Fisher Ames passed the entrance exam to Harvard University at 12 years old. Now, people think that's really impressive today because to get into any university in America back then, Harvard, Dartmouth, uh, whether it was Dickinson, whether it was William and Mary, whether it was Princeton, didn't matter. Everybody took the same entrance exam, and that was you had to be trilingual. You had to show that you're fluent in Latin and Greek and English. Latin because everybody read all the classics. You read Homer, you read Cicero, you read Plutarch. Uh, English is obvious. Why Greek? Because every freshman in their freshman year was given a Greek copy of the New Testament and had to make a translation of the Greek New Testament into English. On average, you did that when you were 13 years old. That's when you went to university in America back then. He was 12 years old. He's just a little smarter than his peers. You do have people like Benjamin Rush. He's called the father of American medicine. 
He came up with medical discoveries 200 years ago, we still use today. He was 14 years old when he graduated from Princeton. I don't know how comfortable you are going to a 14-year-old physician. Probably not many people today are. That's previous generations. You have John Trumbull. He's a justice on the Supreme Court of Connecticut, great literary figure. If you're an advanced placement AP lit, you'll read his stuff. When he was four years old, he finished reading the King James Bible through from cover to cover for the first time. When he was six years old, he beat his minister in a Greek contest. When he was seven and a half years old, he passed the entrance exam to Yale University. Now, his parents held him out because they said, hey, everybody else goes when they're 13, you go when you're 13, and he did. By the way, John Witherspoon, signer of the Declaration, he also finished reading the Bible through cover to cover, four years old. First time he read through the Bible cover to cover, four years old, very common back then. You take someone like James Iredell, ratifier of the Constitution, put on the U.S. Supreme Court by George Washington. James Iredell, 17 years old, was the chief financial officer in his area of North Carolina, ran all the public finances for the entire state of North Carolina. Uh, you have you have Andrew Jackson. When he was 13 years old, he was already a prisoner of war in the American Revolution as a soldier. He was fighting the prisoner, as a prisoner of war against the British. Maria Mitchell, the first woman in America to discover a comet. Uh, she was really into science. She actually set up an observatory to train women in science. Uh, and that was the big thing that she did. Matter of fact, this is her famous telescope that you can still Maria Mitchell, look at this. Now, science. 11 years old, she's a teaching assistant in astronomy. At 12 years old, she calculated the time of forthcoming solar eclipse all by longhand. No computers, no nothing. She just figured it out by the, the circ by the circular motion of the planet. She figured out when the next eclipse would be. 17 years old, she's running her own school in math and science. How come we could do stuff like that back then and it's nearly impossible to do that now? Because we've gone from teaching kids how to think to teaching them how to learn. Uh, I love Pony Express. I'm a cowboy. I'm a rancher. I ride horses all the time. Pony Express, fun stuff. Pony Express, St. Joe, Missouri to California in 10 days or less. 10 days to ride here. Now, if I ride 40 miles on a horse, I've worn my horse out, I've worn me out in a day. If I get 40 miles on a horse, these guys are averaging 180 miles a day riding horseback. They did that 10 days straight. And, you know, it's about the same as going from Iowa to, to San Francisco. It's interesting that when you look, one of the, uh, and by the way, here's the rest of the poster for Pony Express. Wanted, young, skinny, wiry fellas not over 18 must be expert riders willing to risk death daily orphans preferred 25 bucks a week <laughs> notice not over 18. see these guys are having to fight the weather and the elements and outlaws and and you know whatever renegades are out there not over 18 yeah and one of the most famous pony express riders was bronco charlie he was 11 years old as a Pony Express rider. And by the way, that's, I mean, that's moving from St. Joe to, he's 11 years old, riding 180 miles a day, back and forth. Yeah, that was typical. When he was eight years old, he was already a professional bronc at the age of eight. See, our difference was so different back then. Let me take you into the Civil War minute. John Clem, hero of the Battle of Chickamauga, he's from, Ill he's from uh, Indiana. The Indiana newspapers carry the news of their heroes, and this happens to be in the Indiana Register, February 10th, 1864. This is what they tell you. John, little John Clem, in the Army of the Cumberland, promoted for bravery by General Rosecrans, a sergeantcy, has been further promoted by General Thomas to a lieutenancy and placed on his staff. So for bravery on the battlefield, he is made private to sergeant, and then the next general comes along and says, no, 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 you're too important. I need you on my staff. I'm making you lieutenant. Interesting thing, he's but 12 years old. This is the picture of him. That is Lieutenant John Clem. Lieutenant? Now, he's a sergeant there. He got promoted to, to lieutenant. 12 years old? We'd never think of doing that today. Our expectations are so lousy on what we expect from young people. We don't have the high expectations. So that's what we had back then was high expectations. We do not have that today. Uh, we teach kids today, government standpoint, kids, if you can graduate from school, maybe when you're 25, if you're a taxpayer and don't kill someone, you'll be a perfect citizen. That's all we expect from them. That's, that's the objectives we give them. You look at what we had back then. So I'm going to close out this part by showing you some old school books. This is the elementary, you see that elementary spelling book? See that? That's from 1782 to 1932. You learn to spell out of Webster's Blueback Speller, 150 years. Here's your elementary spelling words. You can give these a shot if you want to. For 120, 150 years, this is what every kid learned to spell using these words right here. I can't pronounce a lot of them. I don't know what several of them mean, but I do know that that's what we use for elementary spelling for 150 years. Kids are quite capable of that. We just screwed up our philosophy of education. 
You have the same thing with geography. How about a little fourth grade geography test here? This is from Chicago. You see Chicago, March 27, 1782. You got 35 minutes in this test. How many degrees of longitude are there? How many degrees wide are the temperate zones? Name the principal animals of the frigid zone. What portion of the people on the globe are pagan? What portion Christians? Fourth grade. That's fourth grade public school, 1862. And here's arithmetic, 1862. This is elementary math. These are elementary problems before the sixth grade. Right here. Take this one. I insure two-thirds of a shop worth $3,600 and four-fifths of a house worth $6,000 paying $126. What was the rate of insurance? Anybody want to take that one on? That's basic pre-sixth grade math for every public school kid in America prior to 1960, or you saw 1960, 1862. This one, how many $50 shares at 8% discount must be given for 23 bonds, $100 each, a 2% premium? Every elementary kid in America could work that problem. Then this one is fun. These are all what are called mental math. All of these math books, you have to solve the problems in your head. You're not allowed to use pen and paper. Show you some math problems from 1877. Mental math, try this one. A boat worth $864, of which one eighth belonged to A, one fourth to B, the rest of C was lost. What loss did each sustain it, having been insured for 500 bucks? Solve that in your head. That's mental math. And again, this is sixth grade, this is sixth grade math. <coughs> one more here. If six men can do a piece of work in five days, in what time can they do it if they receive the assistance of three additional men when the work is half complete? That's all our basic education stuff. The scripture says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We were a whole lot smarter when we used religion, morality, and knowledge as the basis of education. There's no question about it. It's academically provable. We can show it statistically even today. We compare that 12% to the 88%, nowhere close. So the things we're looking at, emphasize, and what I want you to get back to is the, the things that we did in the earlier generation, religion, morality, and knowledge, we taught students to think, and we had high expectations. If you don't go to that, you literally are putting lipstick on a pig. You will not change. We can stop Common Core, but something else is going to come along that will be just as bad if we don't, if we don't go back to, to changing the, the overall structure. And that's what we've got to get back to is high expectations, training kids how to think, and get some religion, morality in there as well as knowledge. And so that's the key. So I, I can answer what you want in Common Core, other things, but that's what I wanted you to see is Common Core. We've got lots of information on it, lots of things I can send you to. Critical thinking in Common Core is it's all teacher-centered again. It's not a thinking paradigm, thinking skills. You don't think through things. And what they give you to think through are very liberal equations. For example, in math, uh, you saw the, the little piece on global warming. That's not the science standards. That's part of the math standards. They have you charting global warming, charting things to show. And, and so they keep indoctrinating stuff. And it, it's not like solving math problems like you saw the, the insurance rate or the bond rate or anything else. It's indoctrination stuff. And so that, that makes it very tough. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't know a, a, a nice way to say it, but at, if you're a teacher in the room, please forgive me because I'm not meaning to group you in the group of teachers, but I'm going to talk about the group of teachers. And I know there's good teachers in every group because I was a principal and teacher, et cetera. But in Houston, we gave our public school teachers in Houston, we decided to make them take the same X exam that the kids they're teaching have to take, right? So the teachers that are teaching the kids, 50% of our teachers failed the X exam. Then that's what they're, they're teaching the kids critical thinking. They can't even pass the exit exam themselves. So uh, again, that's where I say with so much of this, we're playing with the fringes and, and moving the, the ship furniture around on the Titanic as it goes down. We're not going back. If, if people want to do critical thinking, I recommend go back and get some of those old math books from the 1860s and try to do some math problems out of that. Go back and do some of the literature out of the 1860s. I mean, that'll blow people's mind to see what critical thinking really was.